to the key at any time you carry these passes, otherwise you have a problem getting back in again. Thirty-one oh three. If you'd like to go through to the stairs, there go down one floor. Hi everyone, welcome aboard. Hi girls, do you know where to find your cabin? Hi everybody. Hello, welcome. I'm the social director of uh, the QE2 and as such my job is looking after many of the VIPs that come on board. Spend a lot of time with the actual passengers on board. I call bingo and I uh, do the horse racing. Hey, how you doing? Welcome home. Gee, how long since you've been on board? I don't ever have to smile. I just enjoy my job. I love the people and the, the difficult ones are just as much fun to work with as the... Uh, they're happy ones, but I never smile if I don't want to. I like the job so much that I smile all the time.
primary function on here is a watch keeping officer. Um, I'm responsible for the safe navigation of the ship for eight hours a day. The captain is in command, but when he's not on the bridge, the officer of the watch is in charge of the ship. We have 126 officers on the ship. We have in total 1,022 crew. So 900 crew members are being managed by 126 officers. prime concern is to get other passengers and crew safely on a voyage and also keep the ship safe. Stage master of QE2, Captain Ron Warwick. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you on board for this transatlantic voyage. Sometimes that does conflict with the, the social side. During the, these crossings we've had a lot of fog. That's potentially a danger, so I would never leave the bridge while there's fog. And accordingly, any social events that are already pre-planned will have to continue without my presence. To make your stay more enjoyable, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We have uh, nine children in the family and 
Uh, it was a very poor existence. I can't even remember if I had shoes uh, before I was about 10 years old. You should now be at your emergency muster station. This is where you would come. And so we had rather a, a, a very poor start. At the age of 14, I left school and started to work. And then at the age of 26, both my mum and dad died. And the three youngest children in the family had nobody to look after them. I took on the responsibility of uh, being their mother and father. Uh, from there, I just concentrated on my dancing full time. I was the Australian dance champion in 1981. I enjoyed the dancing right through until I was 37, but it was time to get my financial life into order. In fact, I have eight homes now and things are looking rather good for my future. On the side of the life jacket, we have a whistle for attracting attention and the whistle will be blown just to attract attention of any passers-by. Um, I don't envy wealthy people who have been wealthy from all of their life and I feel that rather the opposite. I feel that I'm the lucky one because I have earned everything that I have and, and now that I have a little bit more, I really do appreciate it. I don't believe in luck. I believe that you certainly do make your own luck. And I think you can take your own destiny in hand and you can uh, be whatever you want to be. I like to work in the ship, but sometimes, you know, we have a feeling like uh, you miss something, something uh, you do in the Philippines. You miss your family, you miss your friends, something like that. But that is normally happen to everybody. We are, uh, some people, uh, most English and British, they they don't like to be as in a group, a Filipino as in a group. But when it comes to work, you are working together. Sometimes that they go ashore and you leave it there in the ship. You have no feelings to, uh, let us say, uh, come on, jo join us. No, you don't like that. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Pay attention, follow up on the menu here. Sliced turkey breast with walnut salad. Baby shrimp salad with grapefruit. No, what's up, Papa? No, what's up, Papa? Tell him for the table, go. Like Jerry? No. Hey, we're going to play them baby shrimp. That's a bit. Passenger numbers, uh... Jamie, any ideas? Yes, Tom, we're looking at about a passenger figure of about 12.50. Right. I'm still updating our computer at this point in time. Okay. I don't think I'd want to fly even if I could, if I could go on a ship like this. I mean, this is so much fun. If you can afford the luxury of time, certainly this is the loveliest way to travel. When we first began to travel, it was very structured. It was very carefully kept to each class was in a certain area of the ship. Now you no longer have that. You had no sense of any pressure. 
and you're getting all of that wonderful sea breeze. You took 10 days to get across the Atlantic, and you just had absolute peace. There wasn't any sense of hurry. They're practically standing still. In 1937, there were so many ships crossing the ocean, even on the ship. There were so few people on the ship because there's so many ships going back and forth. I mean, we had a table for two, and you couldn't have possibly talked to anybody next to you unless you shouted at the top of your lungs, and they'd wonder what you're shouting about. What would you say, Ellen? I just agree. After 55 years, <laughs> golly day. The other difference in the old days, there was no entertainment provided for you. You had to amuse yourselves. They had a ping pong table on the deck that we played ping pong, you walked, you read, you did things yourselves rather than having entertainment provided for you. And also the valet service you got in your stateroom, they would draw the bath for you and make sure the temperature is right. Now you have to draw your own bath and when you get rusty water sometimes, you lose your temper. <laughs> but other than that, what would you say? I think you summed it up nicely. <laughs> it's really putting me to sleep. Is it putting you to sleep? It is. I think I'll take a little nap. <laughs> well, it doesn't cost anything. It's free. We went to a birthday party together, and uh, no, not together because well, you were no, engaged we to be married to somebody else. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell that. Uh, apparently, something happened, and three months later, we were engaged. So that's really quite a record, isn't it? Especially when she was engaged to somebody else, and I was told it was absolutely hopeless to ever try to get a date with her. Fortunately, the biggest thing that ever happened in my life was when. She went out with me, and I told her the first night, you know something, someday you're going to marry me. Of course, she thought I was off my rocker, but at least we were married in three months, so. <laughs> my father heard we were getting married, and of course, he was delighted with my wife just as much as I was. And he said, do you think your wife would like a trip to Europe? It's really well, then you take on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agreed immediately. I thought it would be oh a lovely God, experience. Out there. Did you see something? No. Just imagination, I guess. No, I didn't see and you know, we were so man. young and so innocent, we didn't realize that what we had was an absolutely wonderful thing. We were just living in the lap of luxury. We had a marvelous time, but we didn't realize at that time how wonderful it was. See, if we were able to walk wherever we want, I mean, we have pretty much full access to the ship. So what's harder is 90% of the crew members aren't. And the public's nice. I mean, they're very complimentary to the shows. I mean, they love the shows. They come on here and they don't expect to see what they're doing. And so a lot of the shows, they, they really enjoy. And, they, and to us, to them, we're like stars. So that most of the time they just talk so to us and say hi. We basically get egos the whole time. Yeah. And I think one thing that is weird though is that you don't get any privacy yeah. because you, you you can't get away from your audience. Like living with your audience is a very strange thing. <laughs> Thank you.
we have the responsibility of being in command or being in control of the most famous liner left in the world. We're keeping a lookout for other ships, icebergs. There's many things to look for, uh, sea life, fishing boats, other ships, etc. So it's, it's definitely not boring or, or lonely, if you like. But, um, it's a very important job. We're the only pair of eyes looking out of the window ahead of the ship now. And uh, there's somebody here 24 hours a day. So we don't rely on electronic navigation equipment all the time. It's, uh, it's still the old method of looking and watching and listening and, and everything. The passengers listen to announcements from the bridge every day and we like to put a bit of variety into them. I used to give um, weather forecasts to the passengers in the morning. I used to do the morning navigator's talk on, on, the, uh, on the speaker system. And if it was going to be a wet day, rainy day, I would tell passengers that we do not expect any rain between the showers. So I used to get a few phone calls after that. What do you mean? What do you mean? There has always been in the British Merchant Navy a friendly rivalry between deck officers and engineers. And many years ago, the chief engineer would draw an imaginary line on the deck and say, you are my engineers. Over there are the deck officers. You will never mix with them. The only engineer and officer that was speaking were the captain and the chief engineer. They had a business agreement. And they called this situation oil and water. And oil and water never mixes. Now, in this day and age, it's impossible to run a ship with that setup. Engineers and deck officers, their areas of responsibility intermingle all the time. Things are coming up which he wanted to skirt, and he's getting old, and he got a little bit of money suddenly. <laughs> so I thought, let's go and spend it and see our youngest son. And that's why we're. I was one of these kids that didn't really know what, what I wanted to do. My father, he used to go away for months on end, so I never really saw a lot of him as a, as a youngster. But then when I was around about 12 and 13, my dad started asking me what I wanted to do. And I used to come up with the, the odd ideas that kids usually do, like being a train driver or something like that. And then in the end, I ran out of ideas and I said, well, I'll go to sea. And he, and he just said, well, that's... It's not a bad life, and it started from there. I don't regard it as the, the last transatlantic liner. I think it probably will be the last one, but I like to be optimistic and, and think that there will always be a ship on the transatlantic liner. I've always had an affinity for the Queen Elizabeth II when it was being built 25 years ago. I remember seeing it and, and thinking, that would be a really nice ship to, to be in command of. My father was here in the very early stages as well. He's sailing across as a holiday with my mother and he's going to visit my brother who lives in the USA. I asked him to come along here with me because it was very special for us because he, 
He sailed with the ship when it first came out, when it was first launched. He was the first captain of the QE2. And now, 20 years later, he comes aboard again uh, with me, his son, as the master. So it's a very, very special for him and for myself, of course. He was very, very close to the ship when it was being built, and it's always been my favorite ship. And I feel very, very proud to have him here on board with me. I wouldn't say it's a difficult job, but it's, it's a job that has many hidden requirements because there's no one uh, to lean on. You have to uh, make all the decisions yourself. And when the time comes to make a decision and all your uh, senior staff are looking at you, waiting for you to make an announcement of what you're going to do, then it becomes quite lonely. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the theatre. Our guest is a Nigerian writer who's resident in London, England. He's published five books, including two volumes of stories. He won England's most prestigious literary award, the Booker Prize, in 1991. Please welcome Ben Okri. I'm sort of pleased that one is doing this event today rather than yesterday because yesterday was very rocky, and so was I. I was born in the middle of Nigeria in a place called Mina, 1959. I was brought to England at the age of two, went back to Nigeria on the eve of the Civil War, came back to England to study literature and to write, which I've been doing ever since. raising artists or writers to the level of priests or sages or anything like that. Artists are only as wise and as good as the effect that their works have on people. Um, and so one is struck by the humility of the figure of William Shakespeare. We don't know anything about him. But his influence and his power has been greater than the power of empires. It's the work that is valuable. The person comes and goes. Every piece of work is dead. Till human beings unlock their own imagination and their own internal response and imbue these things with life. I mean, sculptors don't make the wind change direction. And words on a page most certainly don't leap out and become Don Quixote. If I was going to tell someone uh, about this boat, I would tell them there's nothing greater than the humility of water, and yet it is more awesome than the power and the rage of water. It is the great bearer in terms of the early myths of the journeys of heroes from this plane of consciousness to other planes of consciousness. The ship is really run like a small business. In fact, we even have on board what we call a business group, and that consists of, of me as the head of the group, and then the staff captain who's in charge of all the operational side, the hotel manager that looks after the, the hotel and catering side, and then the chief engineer who looks after the, all the engineering and, and services side.
I was happy before I came here, but because my wife asked for divorce, I wanted to go away, I wanted to disappear. And I've been here nearly five years, five years in October. It's a Portuguese dream, you know. Uh, we always go away from home with two things in mind. It's to, to own something, to build a house, and to own a business. That is probably have to stay here another two or three years to achieve that. It's a wonderful feeling when a guest comes here and say hello, Henry. Oh, nice to see you again. I'm very pleased to see you. And I repeat the same words. I'm very pleased to see you too, madam. And it's wonderful to have you again on the ship. You become attached to people, you know. I come down and give them a hand by tomorrow, right? I just came on board to stay with my husband. He's controlling all the prices and food and beverage that coming and going. Being in a restaurant, we have to be able to smile and to make sure the guest looks at you and they know you're happy, even being unhappy. You have to make sure all the time you are happy. He is very positive man. And he's very fair to his staffs. And he's funny. We use only the uh, fillet of the salmon that's the champion. So we use this part and this part. This is going to be the top ring, and this is going to be the bottom ring. I'd like to come with him. I think it's three months a year the family can go with that crew member or an officer, I don't know. We put about six pieces of them, which weighs about 90 grams. And then once that's finished, we arrange them as it is, and then we put some cream over it. As we put some cream over it, and to bring that color contrast out, a little bit, a touch of caviar. That's what you do. Let's have a thing. This is during the world cruise. This particular lady, she is very funny because she complains about everything. Until to a stage that she cannot complain anymore, she starts picking on the forks, the tablecloth, the napkins, the glasses. One particular night, she ordered this trout. So we make her the trout, cook it a la minute for her and everything nice we presented. So she just tastes a little bit of the trout and she starts complaining. That she says that the fish is tasting fishy. I do not know why, and I do not like it, so take it back. <laughs> that company I was working with chartered Curie 2 in Japan for three months, three years ago. And I was in that project to have a wedding party on board Curie 2. Then I met my husband. <laughs> now, if a, if a passenger were to come and tell you that, what are you going to do? You can say, the fish is too fishy, I don't know what to eat. Those are the things that we get. <laughs> because this is, takes five days to do it, so it's an experience in itself. You, 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 you get to where you want to go, but also you do this. You, you experience all this. If you go on a plane, you just get from A to B. You, you don't count the, the hours that you travel as, as any experience. It's just like well, someone like Simon, it's just traumatic, just being up in a big metal bird and, and uh, 
sweaty. Good morning. The group we've got on board at the moment is called The Cure, and my job is to uh, spend time with them. Uh, they're very different to the other passengers because they're a lot younger, and they only wear black clothes, and they live only in the night time and sleep in the daytime. I think a lot of the passengers that see them on board get rather confused that these sort of people would want to travel on a ship as classy as the QE2 is. being stuck up so high it sort of makes you uh, not relaxed and like, it's just a more sedate way of travelling so, I mean you, you can't you can't if you want some fresh air so you can't walk out on the wing on a plane Room service can I help you? This is Mrs. Watson speaking. Would you come and pick up my dress to go to the laundry? Yes, I will collect your dress, Mrs. Watson. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I am working every day. In the morning I start at 7.30 and I have uh, room service first breakfast or uh, tea orders. I'm start working in QE2 because uh, in QE2 is good money and I can't uh, go back in Yugoslavia where I'm born because there's still war down and I can't work in England because Yugoslav people usually can't work in England. My realm uh, have uh, 14 cabins and uh, I'm making uh, those cabins. I have uh, work on afternoon. It's the same room service, and uh, in the evening I start at seven o'clock, and I have make cabins again for evening. I'm dreaming. Last night and the day before night, and uh, today afternoon. I dream all times in my town, how I'm walking. I've been in my house, and after that I'm going in old town, and after that in one place uh, up, there is the fighting now. The major part of my job on the ship is, of course, to keep the propellers turning, um, to keep the ship running as, as efficiently and as safely as I'm able to do.
I would say a lot of our passengers have absolutely no concept whatsoever about what makes this ship tick. A lot of people come here with this misconception that they're, they're actually joining a hotel. Well, the QE2 is not a hotel and never will be a hotel. For example, QE2 can do a top speed of 32 and a half knots. Okay, there's not many hotels that can do that. Some people come on here and say, there's a bit of a vibration. What's gone wrong, you know? I mean, the amount of horsepower and energy required to push a vessel along at that sort of speed is, is quite incredible. There's 96 megawatts of installed power on QE2 to push her along at that speed. And a certain amount of vibration and movement will occur, as indeed when we're in a seaway. If there's a heavy swell running, even though we are fully stabilized, the ship will move. It has to move. The first time I ever went on a ship was when I was five years old, and that was a long sea voyage across the Atlantic Ocean to Central America with my mother and father. And that was on a cargo passenger ship, and uh, that experience at a very young age, I think, put the, the sea into my veins. I'm a great believer in uh, predestination. If you were to stay at home in order to survive your life, you would never do anything. The exercises we did this morning was to strengthen the muscles in shoulders, arms, wrists, legs and feet. And it's easier in the water on yourself because water is buoyant, whereas it's harder on land. If you are supposed to leave this life in a certain year, you will depart this life in a certain year. The actual happening to yourself, whether it's flying or sailing in a ship is pretty remote. When I was six years of age, I had polio. And the part of me that was paralyzed were my vocal cords. It's a very unusual thing to not be able to speak and not to be able to make any noise at all. So with great joy, when the paralysis left my vocal cords, I could probably tell you I've never stopped speaking, singing, and uh, poetry. I'd like to sing for you a song by Robert Burns. Call the yows, tay the nows. When we are alone, when we're on the bridge, then we can be a little bit more informal. The captain will call us by our Christian names. We, of course, will call him captain or sir. And you must always have that level of respect for the man who's in command. There's nobody above him. He's on his own. He's The buck stops there. He's, it's a very lonely position. It must be like a lot of professions where you have an image of, of a person or a position 
but until you're actually in it, you never really know what it's like. When the time comes that you actually take over the reins and become a captain, then the reality of the situation becomes apparent. Whiskey Oscar Mike, this is Queen Elizabeth II. We are 44 degrees north, 41 degrees west. 44 north, 41 west. I copy loud and clear, loud and clear. How do you copy me, over? Channel 16, Hi, this is Ambrose Pilots back to the Queen Elizabeth 2, Channel 08, sir. 08. Uh, Roger that, sir. Uh, thanks very much for the call. Uh, pilot on your arrival. Yeah, understood. We'll slot it behind the uh, tanker and the oh, container ship. Yeah. You'll be seeing Mark Dredger within the next few minutes on the port side. Just uh, watch for it, please. Okay. Four cables, Roger. Uh, visibility is uh, is uh, not good, sir. Maybe uh, at zero right now. Maritime from the QE2. Uh, Queen Elizabeth 2, this is Trevor Ryder. You have the Maryland off the Buttermill 1 boys going to be bound for the North River, followed by the Tuscarora off the 28 boys going to be bound for the North River. Thank you. 
Stockport, Stockport.